This is Duke University. Yes, my question is, when you made the prediction that Assad would fall in 2013. I didn't say it would fall. I said it would live to 2013. Oh, the, the, the <laughs> no, regime would. No, everybody thought it was going to fall, you know, at the end of 2011 yeah. or the first month. But you didn't say 2015, you said 2013. So why, why did you pick that particular date? For, that, for because that? everybody thought he was going in a week. And I said, I'll, I will go out on a limb and say he's going to at least be there in another year. Okay. I was thinking he could be there two or three years. I don't know. I mean, in, if the Lebanon scenario plays out, he'll be there for a long time to come. He won't be the ruler of the country. But he'll be alive, and the, militia, the military that he is forming now will be still a player on the ground. Hi. Can, okay. um, my question, if Assad goes today as a person, uh, what does the opposition think to do the Alawite minority? Are you Turkish? Yes. Oh, good. I'm from Antakya. From Antakya. Are you Alawite? <laughs> I was trying to figure out. Good. Boy, tell me, where do Alawite Turks stand in this whole thing? What are they thinking? They're scared. They're scared. They're They feel that he has increased sectarian tensions inside Turkey. Because there have been many attempts in the past in Turkey to cleanse that area, and that has Antakya or Marash and all these areas. Now they are thinking it's a second attempt with the opposition to completely clean that area. And actually, I was very sad when I went home to hear someone tell me, we're going to kill you next. That was very disappointing. When you were in Turkey? Yes. Hope it wasn't a good friend. <laughs> of course, 30,000 Alawites did flee in 1938 when it passed from French control to Turkish control or autonomous. Um, the head of the Ba'ath Party, Zaki al Suzi, was from Antakya. Antakya is a key city in the Alawite intellectual world because it's the only city in which Alawites lived with Sunnis in the city and they were very educated and so forth, unlike the cities in Syria. So in many ways the Alawite community was decapitated when Antakya was taken away into Turkey. At least the intellectual capital was decapitated. Um, what was your question again? <laughs> Well, I, ooh, it said he's going to grind them up and serve them to the dogs. Now, but now, that's the supporters of the regime, though. He's been very careful not to be overtly sectarian. I mean, not to be strictly sectarian. When I, I wrote on my site not too long ago, you're nodding your head, thank God somebody reads the site here. But uh, the, 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 a number of militias tried to form the Revolutionary Council, and they brought, came together in a big confabulation about a month ago, or three weeks ago, and they invited Ar-Ur, Adnan Ar-Ur, to be their spokesperson and to be their sort of keynote speaker. And he has become an icon of the revolution for many. So Alawites saw that and began to uh, get nervous because they say, what does they intend for us? Well, you know, but when I put that on, I got attacked by lots of people who wrote me and said, look it, you're just being irresponsible. First of all, a, a fellow academics in the West said, Ad Oud is not overtly sectarian. He'd only said that the Alawite supporters of the regime would be fed to the dogs, not the Alawite non-supporters of the regime. Of course, there are a few Alawite non-supporters of the regime. But uh, there, there are quite a few Alawite non-supporters of the regime. But at any rate. Uh, then others said, hey, there are about at least three Alawite villages that have been overrun by free Syrian army forces in this very northern area near Turkey. And they haven't been killed. They're alive. The opposition doesn't want to kill Alawites. They want their country back. They want a democracy. They want 
They don't want to live under this tyranny anymore. They're, they're sick and tired of the Assads. And now, of course, they'll say the Alawites make it harder and harder for us to know what's going to happen because people are so angry. So many people have been killed. So many people have disappeared. 35,000 dead. 30,000 disappeared into this gulag of torture chambers and other things. So it gets very difficult to know what's going to happen with every additional month of bloodshed and destruction. And, and that's, that's, of course, what's so frightening is you don't know where, that, where it ends. So that's how I answer. I, we don't really know. Mr. Landis, yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I got to give it to you. I'm, I'm from Damascus. I was born in Syria, lived in Damascus the first 18 years of my life. Uh, went to high school, graduated from high school, and came to the United States. What you have just said, 99% is true. I've never heard a lecture where everybody has really given all the right information. So I gave it to you, and I, I applaud you for what you just said. Uh, let me just add for you fourth scenario that I okay. think you said three scenarios. The fourth scenario that I would love to see is United States it champions one or a group of Muslim Sunnis, moderate Muslim Sunnis, that they want to keep all, this, all sectors of Muslims and Christianity in Syria. I'm, I'm American. I'm an Arab American. I'm proud of both countries. I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud to be an Arab Syrian. I would not, I would not leave my country for nobody. I will die till I die. I, my two kids, I took them to Syria. They were born in the United States. They, were, they lived there for six years. I have a son. He was five years old when he left and went to Damascus. When he was young, he said, Dad, I will not go back to this country. I forced him when he was five years old, he didn't know much, to go and live in Damascus. He lived there for six years. I was going to bring him with me. He's now in the ninth grade here. He, will, he told me today before I even come, he said, I will go back to Syria I don't, and I, I want to die in Syria. This is how much we love our country. This is how much we, 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 love, we love Syria. So what I'm thinking here is, and I hope this is... I also read about you that you, you, sometime you can be an advisor for some in the White House, for some people in the White House. Train, <laughs> train some people, some moderate, some moderate Muslims, okay, that they can rule Syria after Assad. I do not like Assad. I'm a Druze. You're fully aware of who they are. We are just like you are. We are very minority. The Druze now, they are not with and they're not against. We're just sitting, you're the, you just said it, they're just going between the legs. We don't want anything to do with either one of them. And I live in, in, a, in a, a city that has got 50,000 Druze lives in it. And my best friend just died this morning in a car bomb. So they're trying to get everybody going in Syria. Okay? I'm against the, Syri the, the Free Syrian Army. Because I don't think they are a Free Syrian Army anymore. They are coming from all over the world. I just hope that when America says we support democracy, that they really do support democracy. But you know, you and I, we know that they don't. Hosni Mubarak was not a democratic president. Saudi Arabia, it is the worst country on earth today when it comes to democracy. And who's supporting these countries? Who is the their f number one cheerleaders? United States of America. Who created Osama bin Laden? That Mr. Obama now. He's trying every. We killed Osama bin Laden. Who created him? We did. The CIA did. All we want, we want peace in our country. We want, we want peace in the whole Middle East. And who's benefiting from the whole thing? And I'm not going to say anything about the Jews. The, my best friends are Jew. But the Israelis are sitting aside watching everything that is going on without even spending a dime while we, the Arab, destroying each other. For what? For oil. For control of the area. For control of the whole Middle East. Why don't we force peace in the Middle East where we bring Israel and everybody in the whole world to have peace in the Middle East and then instead of just having one Israel and two million Jews supporting or with the United States, then you will have two or three hundred millions Muslims 
with the United States. Thank you. That's very, uh, thank you for your comments. I think, uh, Germana. Germana. Uh, I knew it. I, Germana is a neighborhood. It's, it's a village. It used to be the big village outside of uh, Damascus. Uh, yes, I've been to Germana. It's, it's now a very shared village. A lot of Iraqis went there. And um, it's a very mixed place. But it was the sort of Druze capital of Damascus. Uh, okay. uh, I won't repeat my countryman said. Uh, actually, I've been in many lectures, and you give very good pictures and kind of real picture. Uh, I'm coming from a Christian minority. My grandfather was the only survivor from his family when, again, during the Turkish genocide against Christian. We are a Syrian. We suffered uh, during the Ba'ath party because we are not Arab also. Uh, just I want to focus on one point uh, you said about why minority doesn't uh, that will not, will not survive the regime because they are minority. Also, I want to add, it is the fight of existence for minority in Middle East. That's uh, true for Jewish, that's true for Alawi, and it's true for Christian. And it was true for Maronite, and that was the reason Maronite fought. Because everyone born there, we, we have long history of bloody. And in Middle East, people don't forget. Sunnah, Shia, remember 1400 year when how they killed. For that, it's battle of existence. And when you lose, you disappear. It's like a Christian, as you said, 20% of Turkey, just they wiped 20% of population. For that, this is the fight. It's not about you losing, other one take power. When you lose, you're gone. This is kind of one point I want uh, to add. And I have actually two questions. Uh, I want your opinion on it. Uh, first question. What would be the reaction of the international community if the Kurdish took part of Syria? And of course, all opposition, all Arab, everyone is against that. I want this part, question, your opinion about it. The second question also, I want your opinion. If the opposition win, and I'm pretty sure there will, uh, will be a big massacres against Alawi and a lot of minority and a lot of supporter from Sunni. There is a lot of Sunni also support and they will suffer a lot of also massacre against them. What will be the reaction also from it? Kind of, I want your opinion on these two points and thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your... Uh, we're going to have to find a Sunni <laughs> Syrian in this audience here to... Uh, um, give us their outlook. Uh, the, your first question is, will the international community accept an independent Kurdistan in Syria? I think they will. You know, the only people who won't accept it, are the two people who won't accept it, are Arab Syrians and Turks, who, who've raised objections. But the Turks weren't going to accept an independent Kurdistan here. And they have come to become the biggest protectors of Kurdistan and Iraq. Most of the business done in Kurdistan is Turkish business. Most of the builders are Turkish. Most of everybody is Turkish. Who's, the economy, it's been great for Eastern Turkey and for Turkish regimes. And Turkey has seen now the Kurdish part of Iraq in many ways as their stepping stone to influence in Iraq. So, They've gone from being totally inimical to the idea of Kurdistan to being a protector of this Kurdistan. Now, they don't want to see it grow. Obviously, this presents a lot of fears for, um, for Turkey because if Kurdish separatism grows here, which it is doing, then it's going to grow here. And it's going to reanimate the question of greater Kurdistan, which... In many ways, Turkey was hoping that a small Kurdistan in Iraq would be the ideal solution. Because then it would be like Israel or something like that, where Kurds could go visit, find an out, find an, a, a, a satisfying answer to their desire for a national home, and then come back to Turkey and be good Turks, if you will. And uh, that would have been the ideal solution for Turkey. And I think Turks got used to that notion. 
Now, this greater Kurdistan creates another question because it's, it's been accompanied by a recrudescence of violence in Turkey. And there have been uh, dozens of people killed in the last few weeks by bombs going off in the PKK, the, the Kurdish Working Party, has uh, gone back on the warpath, if you will, um, inspired to a certain degree by the Syrian turmoil. So that's worrying Turkey. But I think that if things settle down and they, the Kurds, it really depends on how the Kurds respond. If they are unified and they don't fight each other, which they might do, um, and they hunker down, it'll be very hard to defeat them, particularly if these Sunni Arabs don't unite and fight each other. If they unify, they'll want to take back the East. There's no doubt about it. They're not going to want to give it up. Um, in the same way that I think the Arabs in Iraq would like to have this area, but they realize it's untenable to take it back through violent means because America, Turkey would probably defend them and they wouldn't be able to do it. And what would they do with all those Kurds? It's very hard to occupy the whole territory. They tried to do it under Saddam Hussein and they failed. So that's my attitude is that I think, you know, I think that the question is where does a line get drawn? How much oil? goes into the Kurdish part. And this is where most of the oil is in Syria, right here. So if the line comes into the oil, of course, there's a lot of water up there. There's other important assets. It's a big loss for Syria. And Arab Syrians do not want to lose it. They would see this as Sykes-Picot too, which is Absalom. Let me, uh, oh, excuse me. I, I've, OK. All right. I, I'm, uh, I'm not in charge here. OK. Good. Um, I'm a retired Foreign Service officer and served uh, twice in Syria. I, I'd like to take a slightly different look at your three models. The first is the Ataturk model where the Turks went, alo went it alone. So it's, um, in this case, uh, could Syria do have a solution on its own? The other two required input from um, the international community. So in the Lebanon model, the Taif Accords, where uh, the cooperation came from the United States, Saudi Arabia, Israel to some extent, uh, the Syrians, of course, with, uh, with, with, the, uh, with the Americans. Um, uh, and then on the Iraq model, even though the United States bungled it, uh, you had the Americans, the British, and the Turks to some extent, and, and perhaps some others to try to put together Iraq, right. uh, blew it miserably. If you could construct a, uh, should, should the Syrians go it alone? Or if not, if they need outside uh, help, how would you construct a diplomatic consortium? I mean, our, our uh, Drew's friends suggested the United States be, take the, the leader. leader. How, would you, how would you construct that? Well, America's tried to do it. They tried to set up the Syrian National Council, which has failed, and now Clinton won't even talk to anybody to do with Syrian clans. She's just furious at them and felt deceived by them. So they set up an office in Istanbul, and they're trying to meet all the different commanders on the ground, and they're trying to meet with the coordinating committees, uh, political, on-the-ground people, and commanders. And obviously, they don't like what they see because they're not committing to anybody uh, so far. But at least they don't know that's the excuse they're using. But I think that I think Obama has been excessively timid because he's got elections. There's great potential for Syria. Anybody can see the potential for Syria. 70% Sunni Arabs who have been extremely moderate throughout history. They're not Wahhabis. They're much more open-minded. They're used to living with minorities. The, certainly the commercial elite of Aleppo and the major cities, Damascus, are liberal-minded. There's, of course, the, Sunni infle or the Sufi inflection. You can, you can come up with this Levantine model that every Syrian will tell you is the real Syria and why Syria is different from Lebanon or Iraq, that we have this liberal attitude towards the world, that we want to get along, we deal, we're not fanatical, so forth. So that is a ballast for a new Syria. And, uh, <coughs> you know, one thing to do, I wrote an article, I broke with my, several months ago I, had, I wrote an article on foreign policy to stay out of Syria. This was like three or four months ago. Last week I wrote another article 
suggesting that we help destroy the Syrian Air Force if Assad doesn't come to some kind of negotiating stand by giving shoulder-held missiles, which is what the opposition wants. Because I'm very worried about America getting sucked in and becoming responsible for rebuilding Syria. I mean, from American, from a just nuts and bolts point of view, America, Syria is a country the size of Iraq, 24, 23 million people who are extremely poor. The per capita GDP in Syria was about $3,000 before the revolution broke out. It's probably fallen to $1,500 because the currency has collapsed. And uh, people are not going to be able to feed themselves this winter. There's about three hours of electricity a day. The school system is broken. And it doesn't have the oil to rebuild like Iraq did. I mean, we could go in and tell everybody, oh, in six months, Iraq will pay for itself. Of course, that was not true. But today, Iraq is now producing the kind of oil that we were thinking it might produce in six months. But in Syria, there's not going to be any money like that. It's going to have to come from the outside world, or it's not going to come. So if America takes on this project, you're saying, it's going to be footing the bill. It's going to need to help foot the bill. Congress is not going to do that. We just came up with, what, $600 million to support post. The State Department proposed a fund of a little less than $700 million to support post-Arab Spring countries on a case-by-case -case basis. The Congress voted it down. No money to help any Arab country in the post. The American people do not want to spend a dime. So how do you do it without spending any money is really what your question is. Well, who else? Not the United States. I mean, let's say we could spend a little bit of money. I mean, the trouble is the constraints are so furious on what America can really do. The military does not want to get into the business of Syria at all. You can, we've been holding classes in Copenhagen and everywhere else where we try to get all the opposition leaders together and give them seminars on you know, whale hugging or whatever it is that we give them seminars on in Washington. USIP just did this big the day after project, but most of the people who participated in that have no social base at all whatsoever. I mean, this is Shelby all over again. I don't mean, they're all good people that are involved in this. They're people you would want to have dinner with. But they don't have, you know, it, it underlines the terrible problem in Syria is there isn't, there aren't um, politicians that are known that have a, a shared base. So you've got to, what you have to do, I mean, what's going to happen is the militia leaders are going to get bigger and stronger. And America's going to have to just choose to back them if it wants to change the balance of power. And that would mean giving them some weapons. Shoulder-armed missiles and tank, anti-tank weapons. That would change the balance of power in Syria very rapidly. Then you have to live with Sunni militia leaders who are some kind of Islamist. But I don't think they would be fanatical Islamists. They turn out to be. The thing is, you're going to have a lot of Al-Qaeda and other groups that are going to be still there when this is finished. Because you're not going to send in drones to kill them like we do in Afghanistan or, or Pakistan or, uh, or Yemen. Maybe we will. I don't know. I hope not. But there's going to be a messy problem. And America is going to have to somehow restrain itself by helping Islamists who are going to set up some Sharia courts and are going to do some Islamic light stuff. And there's going to be a lot of fumbling around. And, um, and people at home are going to be screaming about murder the whole time, including some people in this room uh, who are going to be saying, oh my gosh, I don't want a Syria like that. And it's going to be hard for America to do that because it's going to be very mussy. But ultimately, the minorities have had their foot on the neck of the Sunni majority in Syria for 45 years. And that's an untenable situation. It's doomed. It can't go on. And America says it's on the side of democracy. And yet it's supported these dictators, or it's put up with them. And if it wants to side with democracy, it's going to have to go to the other foot. If it wants secularism, it, it should stick with Assad. He's, he represented a form of secular Syria, right, to get this minority community ruling. We don't want that, in theory. America, 
So they're going to have to go, but they're, they can't bring themselves to accept the democratic, what Syria really is, which is Islamist. They can't figure out how to do that in Tunisia or Libya or Egypt. Every one of these countries that's had a revolution, we're bellyaching over whether we've done the right thing, how do we, get, how do we support this, what do we, how do we really support democracy and not vilify these political parties that have already come to the fore because they're going to do some distasteful things from an American point of view. They're not going to be secular. They're going to. And, uh, and Syria is going to be messy. And that's what you'd have to do. If you want America to lead the way, I think, you change the balance of power. The trouble with cutting the head off the regime so totally, like doing a Libya, and many Syrians ask me, why don't we just do a Libya? Send in the jet fighters, bomb the presidential palace, kill Assad, and bomb all of his tanks and his whatever he's built in Syria. And then leave. You know, bomb and leave. That's the American, new American way, the cheap answer. The trouble is, this leaves the Alawites and other minorities completely vulnerable. And you don't know what could happen. And if something bad happened, America would be responsible. We would have to go in there and stop it from happening, or, or we wouldn't. But if we go in, then we're stuck. If we don't, so that's, you know, the, so you have, you're playing a little tinkering game. We're trying to change the balance of power without uh, changing it too much. And, uh, and you could do that by supplying arms on a sort of controlled basis and changing the balance of power and seeing if you can destroy the Syrian Air Force, which is doing tons of damage. And I don't think, the reason I wrote that article is because I don't think Assad can reassert his power over the country again. And the Air Force is doing a ton of damage in cities like Aleppo, the neighborhoods north of Aleppo and Idlib and so forth, which is not going to put him back into power and solve Syria's problem. It's just killing people. And, uh, and so that's, that's a dilemma. And I go back and forth on this. I wrote an article, did that, and you know, I can't tell you, my wife's inbox <laughs> and my inbox, people I know and I love are writing and saying, Joshua, how can you side with terrorists? Are you trying to kill your people for years? We've been kind to you and fed you at our tables and so forth. Fifteen people from my family have died fighting against these terrorists and so forth. And now you are spitting in their faces. I mean, that's, uh, my inbox was just dumped full of this stuff. And, uh, you know, it's like, why get into this policy crap? I don't want to, I just don't, it's not worth it. And that's what America is going to be into, right? That's what we're getting ourselves into. If we go in there and try to solve this problem, you're going to hurt somebody badly. And uh, we got to know what we're doing as we do it, because it needs a fine tooth comb. I'm not in control. I just want to say to Mr. Landis, I hope that you will not send missiles or destroy the Air Force in Syria, because what you're doing now is you are with those free Syrian army that nobody wants at this point. Okay, because now there are so many of them are divided. This is my inbox. It, and After you the, it, the leadership in these, in this with the Syrian army, it is not. So there. how should America support these Islamist light groups that you are trying to tell it us is to very support? Simple. America in Syria and, and in a lot of the Middle East, they don't have a good reputation. They need to work on their reputation, number one. They need to, everybody say, we're the American, we are coming. So everybody's going to say, let's go behind these people. America killed millions of Iraqi. Nobody trusts the American, and they went there for nothing. For nothing. Yeah. And we still pay them for it. I agree. I agree. This is the... Uh... Okay. Thank you. We have a lot of students in the room, and I just wondered if any of the students who are here have a question before, I, before we go to... Uh... Come on, students. Yeah. Um... <laughs> So, I was just wondering, like, is there a breaking point for Turkey here? Are they going to continue to accept all the refugees, or, or be, you know, shelled occasionally by uh, 
by the Assad regime is there? Do they have well, Turkey, Erdogan is in a bind today because... He made the same calculation in 2011 that almost everybody else was making, which is Assad is going down fairly soon. And so he jumped on board, and it was easy for him to make the decision he made. And he hesitated. Remember, he, it took him a few months, and America was aghast that he would continue to visit Assad as long as he did. But once he made his decision that Assad was not going to change, no reform, he went with democracy and anti-military, anti -military, because that's what his reputation is in Turkey, is somebody who fought the Kemalist military as a civilian and who brought people power to the heart of government. Okay, that's what he wants to be. We've got a, a Turk shaking her head emphatically behind you. Um, so he made the decision. He went with what he knows. It's like America. Every time you see a problem, you say democracy is the answer, right? Because it's the only thing you know. It's your national religion. And you're just going to say it. And, and then you're stuck with democracy, whether you like it or not. Uh, at least you, you, know, you have to go in that direction. And, and Erdogan made, did exactly the same thing. He said anti-military, no more dictatorship, and democracy. Now, America tried to get him to take this leading role. And he was, you know, theoretically, at least this is what he told Americans, was that if you go first, we'll come in behind. And America said, you go first, and we'll come in behind. And so everybody was a you first situation. And um, now he's, he's tons of criticisms coming his way, because he's, he's exacerbated the Kurdish problem in Turkey. He's exacerbated the sectarian problem, as we've just heard. Shiites, and it's not just the Alawites, it's the Alavis, who are like 15 to 20 percent of the other heterodox Muslims in Turkey, who feel like this is a Sunni karate chop. And, uh, and he's got this refugee problem because he's helped destabilize and he's running the Syrian opposition. So all these Al Qaeda and other foreign jihadists are coming through Turkey to go to Syria. And there's lots of Syri Turks who are saying, why are you allowing these people through our country? What are you, are you, it makes him look like he's an Al-Qaeda supporter, which he doesn't want to look like. So he's got a massive problem on his hand and people are pissed off in Antakya. They're all thinking, what are these dirty Syrians doing over here, stealing from us and increasing in criminality? And now they're going to want to go to Turkish schools. They're going to want to have Turkish jobs. They're going to be, they're going to be Turks because they're not going to go home. There's nothing for them at home. Who wouldn't want to be a Turk? It's a great country. And uh, so Erdogan's got a problem. I don't think it's going to break him. I don't, it's going to hurt his prime ministership immensely. It already has. But, uh, you know, Turkey's a wealthy country. It's a rich country. It's, you know, I think they'll, they'll work through this. But they're going to get a lot of crap because they're sitting on a 500-mile border with Syria. And Syria is melting down. Just if there are people who need to leave because you have yeah, a place free. to be, why, why don't you go ahead and go and then we'll take more questions from the people who need to say. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming, you guys who are, have to go someplace and get some dinner. <laughs> yeah, an hour and a half of Syria. <laughs> well, thank you very much. No, no, it's great. Uh, it's great. I don't agree with you on Iraq, though. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, that it's becoming a dictatorship or that it's uh, No, that, that uh, I mean, the Americans did a lot of bad things. One thing we did not do was demolish the Iraqi army. We disbanded the Iraqi army. They all went home. That was the problem. We should never have done that. Right. But it would be very hard to keep it in the same way that trying to keep the Syrian army. It's going to be disloyal. It's going to be disloyal. Yeah. Okay. 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 You guys, I good to have you staying here. Um, <clears throat> okay. Okay. So, well, I'm not an area expert at all. I'm a political scientist. I'm an assistant professor here in the political science department. 
put the speaker closer to your mouth. Okay, so Good. so my questions are more thinking about the theory and you know political science Good. in general um, because these things are you know interesting me. But I was thinking first of all, like it doesn't seem that uh, the strategy that uh, Assad has followed is very rational. So we basically the way you phrase it or the way you explain it or the way I understood was that basically he's a minority. Uh, this identity is not very much mobilized yet. When the conflict starts. He mobilizes the identity, the Alawite identity more, and then he starts committing genocide, trying to cleanse this. But so it doesn't seem very rational, right? Because it's really costly to do this. It would have been more rational to, for him and for and better for everyone, right? That that he would have done some kind of, I don't know, concession or like try to make some alliances, right, with, with the, 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 the 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 insurgents or uh, the protesters. So I I was a bit. Com Confused, and this brings me to my, my second point, which is that in in your talk, you you talk about identities as somewhat fixed in the region, but then you also you know you you make the point that that they, these identities are these are mobilized strategically, right, by by the elite. So I'm a bit confused. Well, you know, I don't believe that identities are primordial. I don't like to think this way, and I don't think that this will lead us to any solution. Probably looking at, at these problems this way, it's not going to lead us to a solution. We need to think, you know, that there are cross-cutting cleavages, there are uh, possible alliances between groups, and 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 that we don't need to create homogeneous societies to get democracies, right? And so, yeah, I wanted to hear your point on, on a primordial question. I agree with you. Yeah. It does sound like I. Uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for your questions. Um, I do not think that. Identities are primordial, although I did draw this model of the minoritarian regimes and the long and bloody. And I, you know, the, obviously this model is based on the fact that you have different ethnic groups in one country that are struggling to find an identity that they haven't found, right? It's presumption that they're not going to find an identity together. I don't think that identities don't change. I know they change all the time, um, but they change slowly. And they're, they can backfire. I mean, they can be mobilized again. And now, now, what Assad's strategy was, on kind to power, was not being an Alawite. It's secularism. The Ba'ath Party was all about secularism and secular Arab nationalism. And, and it raised Arab nationalism to this highest, highest high of a high peaks because that becomes the overriding value. So everybody, whether they're Sunni or Kurd or uh, Ashuri, has to give up any identity but Arab. And Aruba becomes the thing. But that is a disguise. At least many of the Sunni Arabs feel that that is a fakey wakey way of having a bunch of minorities be able to slip into the top ranks of government and keep their foot on the throats of a bunch of Sunnis. Now, on the other hand, everybody in Syria sees the benefit of nationalism. They all want to be nationalists, and they say yes, or at least they cowed into saying yes, because it is nationalism. But it's very clear what the Alawites are doing. They're saying, we're nationalists, but we don't really believe it. That's why we stuck all the Alawites up here at the top. And they didn't fool many people. I mean, they, they did fool young people, I think, who did feel that there was a stronger sense of nationalism. But, but um, that was a strategy. When war came out, excuse me, I'm slim, he had to back away from that. And Assad pursued a sort of Sunni foreign policy, Sunni, an anti-Israel, Arabist foreign policy. And he was the biggest Arabist of all the Arabists in the world, and he was going to be the resistance front and so forth. And that's what made him look Arab. And it protected him from this sort of Shiite crescent thing. When the revolution broke out, he flipped 180 degrees. And he began to pursue a minority policy, a classic minority policy, which is side with the uh, minorities, give Kurdistan to the Kurds, let them separate it off the PKK, the people he had considered terrorists. Now, he had supported them against Turkey. But inside, you know, Kurdish nationalism, he tried to destroy in every conceivable way. And here he was promoting Kurdish nationalism in the last six months because he wants to hurt Sunni Arabs. And so 
he has given guns to Christians. He's given guns to the minorities. I don't know if he came to the Jebel Druze and gave guns, but he would have if they'd asked for it. But they're too busy running between his legs. And the, the so he's been pursuing a minority policy, but that's very it's 180 degree from what he was pursuing outwardly beforehand. So he's mobilized the Alawite identity. He tried to destroy Alawite identity and keep it at the same time. Of course, he was putting Alawites in the army, but he was telling the religious leaders that you're not Alawite, you go to mosque, you pray five times a day, he encouraged people to build mosques, you know, the whole nine yards to deny their own religion. So he was trying to change Alawites. He was trying to bring them into the mainstream so they wouldn't be weirdos. Um, at the same time as he mobilized them to be in the security forces. So he couldn't have it both ways, but he was trying, in a sense, to do both. I guess that would be my only way. Okay, very quick. I mean, thank you. It's, it's a little bit of follow-up, but the other way, the other direction. I mean, you, you portray the, um, the Assad regime as being cohesive, powerful, and the... Uh, the, the Compared to the opposition. Yeah, the opposition is fragmented. So, so in terms of... Uh, I mean, what is, what, what is uh, motivating the opposition, the armed guerrillas, to fight if they know they are going, almost like going to lose a battle? They don't have foreign support. They don't have good uh, supplies of arms. They are fragmented. So why would they be fighting? Uh, I mean... Well, for a long time, they didn't fight, right? For 45 years, they didn't fight. They rose up, the Muslim Brotherhood, and they were defeated severely and killed in a very brutal way, which of course sent shivers of fear throughout the rest of the Sunni community. And they lived in this fear and isolation. The Arab Spring brought together and created, you know, I can't, I spent a lot of time interviewing opposition people and everything before the Arab Spring, and none of the opposition people had any young followers. They all, Riyadh, the Turk, and so forth, they'd all complain that they don't have any youth. It's all these older guys who are ex-communists or lefties, and they would have, they could fill up one microbus or maybe a whole Pullman with their followers, right? This was the problem in Syria. Nobody had an opposition party. Arab Spring came along, and this youth was mobilized. Um, and it was, you know, we've got to remember that Syria, the median age in Syria is 21 years old, okay? Right. Well, the Arab Spring had this magic dynamic, which was that a lot of people united in Syria who had never united, they found this common voice, and social media played this magic role of connecting the Mahjar with the inside, and they'd always been separated, and creating a sense of community, which had never been there, and the regime had always been able to sort of atomize people. And that created this incredible unity oh, on the outside for these first months. But once the regime came down with a, this giant sledgehammer and started to kill people, divide and rule, and that's what the regime has always done, is divide and conquer. And the regime began to do this in a brutal way, which is using their airplanes, bombing towns. If the, if the foreign, if the free Syrian army comes into a town and begins to take over, they blow it to pieces. And they let the people know, don't let those people into your neighborhood or we're going to destroy you. And that's what you see, if you watch the front line Syria episode that was shown last, the free Syrian guys are going through Aleppo, through the streets, and people are coming out of their buildings saying, get out of here, why are you coming to my neighborhood? You're going to bring, you know, you're going to kill, destroy our houses on our head. The regime's going to come here and all, everybody's going to get killed and our houses are going to be destroyed. Get out of here. And what do those guys say? They turn around and they said, when we were in Homs for two months, what did you do? You just sat at home. Shut up. You know, it's your turn. And the regime has divided Syrians. Today, people don't like the Free Syrian Army who liked it a few months ago. And that's, you're one of them, which is what's, and that's because the high price that the regime is forcing Syrians to pay. And their strategy is a scorched earth strategy. Um, 
and that's making many Syrians think, why are we doing this? I don't want to go through this. I don't want to lose my house. I don't want to lose my city. The regime is, you know, of course it's blackmailed the Syrian population for 45 years and it's doing it at a much higher level now, which is to terrorize them. And most people don't want to go through this. And I think that's what's, you know, all the upper classes have left the country already. And uh, at any rate, it's a very dismal picture, and I, I hate to say it, but it, there was a lot of unity. And maybe if things had, if Assad had just sort of created a constitutional committee and said, have elections, and I'll be out of here in two years, they would have held this kind of unity, and a new national identity would have formed. But it didn't happen that way, and it, we're being reduced back to that sectarian essentialist identities and everybody's racing back to their little communities and of course we've, we've got a reversal and uh, and it didn't have to be that way perhaps but I think it's ending up that way. Thank you. Produced by Duke University online at duke.edu